And we're here to talk about your new book, Invested. You've written a number of books already, so what's the deal with the new one? Well, the old books that are written about investing, this is about the story of Schwab from 1973 on to the present. How a company, I think entrepreneurial company, we had a great purpose. We wanted to help individual investors. We wanted to tell the story about all of that and how we got to where we are today. It's a pretty neat story. The story of the company is inseparable from the story of the man behind it, yourself. And the book is also chock full of examples from your personal history. Uh, one thing I was pretty interested in was to learn about your dyslexia. Right. How has that affected your life? For me, it was about reading. Very, I'm a very slow reader. And I think because of that, I take books and have to spend more time reading them than you would normally. And so I think it just helped me sort of concentrate more and to be more serious about my various things, including my education. And so in some ways it helped me uh, to have somewhat of a handicap. Is it difficult to write a book being dyslexic? Well, I need help, and that's sort of the fundamental thing that I discovered early on, that I wasn't great at everything. And so in building a business, I would reach out to many of my cohorts who were fantastic in technology, fantastic in HR, fantastic in other subject matters that I wasn't. And they would help out, and I would give them complete freedom to do things. And so I think we had the benefit that uh, the guy who led the company gave everyone a lot of confidence that they could contribute their, uh, their specialty in making a great company. You had the opportunity in your book to take a stroll down memory lane. There are some great moments in the book where you discuss, uh, you know, people sitting at a long table, passing, uh, you know, red and blue pieces of paper back and forth, taking trades uh, by phone, entering them into a terminal. That's um, what it was. That was 1974 or five. There was these write up the tickets, there'd be a f five piece ticket and carbon copies. So you'd write down, buy me 100 shares of IBM and then go down the conveyor belt and they'd tear it apart. One part would go to the margin department, another part would go to the, uh, the trading department and so forth. And they put the order in a teletype. Uh, primitive, very primitive then. And then you actually, there was sort of a moment where you, uh, you know, you kind of bet the, the future of the firm yeah. by implementing a computer system to automate all of this. We were about three years into it and I just knew that we couldn't continue doing it the way we were doing. So we found a company that we had a computer capability that we had in mind that would really put us completely online. But it cost $500,000. That was the entire net worth of the company but I signed the contract anyway. I knew we needed to have that thing. We got to pay them over time, which was great. But it was the whole net worth of the company that I bet at that moment, but it worked out. In the book, you mentioned an event called May Day that was hugely important to Charles Schwab, uh, the company, and its success going forward. What happened on May Day? Well, leading up to May Day was a congressional examination, SEC examination, Congress generally, about how fixed commissions had been in place for over 200 years. And so there was lots of changes going on in the world then. This is now back in the 1970s about price controls and things of that nature. There was a decision made by Congress, et cetera, to take off uh, the fixed rates and create a open community so rates could be whatever the competition wanted to charge. And that was a critically important day because that was the day that we dropped our rates substantially and a few other firms, including Merrill Lynch, raised their rates. So it created for us a huge opportunity. I, you know, I'm sitting there with 10 people as employees and Merrill Lynch had 10,000 or 20,000. So anyway, I saw this gap and uh, went after it. At the same time, you were trying to lower fees, keep them as low as possible for your clients. Um, and yet you were trying to grow the company. Uh, and that caused a little bit of tension because you needed cash to continue funding the growth. How did you manage that balancing act? Well, it wasn't easy because I couldn't access Wall Street easily. We were really their competition in some way because we were charging such low rates. And they certainly didn't want to support us and have us flourish because it would be obviously hurt their business. So we had to go to friends and relatives and different uh, 
people that I knew personally to get funding, and so it was always difficult early on. Your uncle seemed to be an important factor there. Uncle Bill was fantastically important to me. I'd helped him earlier in a different part of his career. He was in the lumber business, the food, wood products business. So I helped him along the way in raising some money for him, and I was on his board of directors. So he was returned the favor to me. Even before you started the company, um, you were interested in stocks, in growth companies. You wrote a little bit in your book about a bubble that happened in the 60s, in the early 60s, about bowling. People thought bowling was going to be the next big thing. Yeah. It was like Netflix is today, where everybody's you know, spending hours a day uh, doing this activity. What did you learn from that experience? Oh, it was a wonderful early experience for me. I just got out of Stanford Business School in 1961. The hot stocks then were bowling companies. People made bowling alleys, owned bowling alleys, made bowling shoes, bowling balls, you name it. Anything chalk was very important. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds a little absurd today, but the analysts were calculating that if we got 80% of the population to bowl, and how often it would be, they projected these incredible numbers, and so these stock prices went unbelievable heights. Well, within six months' time, they went to unbelievable lows, and many of them went broke. What did you learn about bubbles from that experience? Well, I learned how crazy people can get in terms of valuation of stocks, but it happens periodically. We had many, many crashes that were involved around whether it was technology at one time or the Internet was introduced in the early 2000s, um, 2000. Six, when the mortgage bubble, everybody could get a mortgage, no problems at all about that, and boom, crash it comes. So when things get excess, excessive valuations or availability or free money, that kind of thing, and all of a sudden, corrections occur. One of the more recent manias that have been capturing people's attention is cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. and Bitcoin. Um, what's your opinion on those assets? Well, I'm not a, a big fan of cryptocurrencies itself. I'm certainly a, a big fan of blockchain and the possibilities that that could happen with bigger and better computers. It would actually really improve privacy for people in a different, uh, different way than we have today. Cryptocurrencies, until it gets sort of backed up by a Federal Reserve or by gold or by something, uh, not just nothing, I'm sticking with the U.S. dollar. Speaking also of bubbles and sort of overheated stocks, uh, you know, one thing that we've seen in the stock market today is tech companies, you know, trading at insane valuations. Uh, a lot of these companies are coming out of the private markets with tons of VC funding, um, but very little to speak of in terms of profits. They're usually cash burning. What do you make of this trend? Because you, you're on the record saying that you love growth companies. Right. You know, they've kind of taken that to the logical extreme. Sure. But it's happened in my career uh, over the last 50 years. There have been many cycles like this. And so this is no different. Uh, some of them, a few of them might make their way through, like certainly Amazon has proved themselves, uh, Facebook to some degree, although they're now beginning to see some difficulty maybe on this privacy issue, how they're taking your information, whether it's Facebook, your information, my information, and creating all kinds of value out of it. Uh, so same with Google, same with these others. And so how are we going to sort out all that? Do they get to keep it or do they have to pay us for it? We'll figure that one out in the future. That is a, a hot topic. There's a, a book I recently read called Surveillance Capitalism. Um, and, you know, sort of the thesis of the author is that uh, all these companies that are turning data into money and sort of sucking up everybody's data, um, breaching people's privacy, it's, uh, it's a bad thing is kind yeah. of <laughs> the end result. Some people do don't you, care, uh, but a lot of us do care. D are you, yeah, which camp do you fall in? I care. <laughs> <laughs> I care a lot. I mean, at Schwab, for instance, uh, you know, you think about our thing. We have a vast number of clients and information, all their financial information. We want to make sure everything we do is a private. There's no compromise ever about that. Now, just think of what financial what banks could do with your information. Uh, and of course, Facebook has there's no restriction on what they do and what they can do. They got it all.
Speaking of Facebook, I may as well get your opinion on Libra, their cryptocurrency project that they announced with uh, a whole bunch of partners. Um, what is your view on that? Well, I think uh, many of the people in Congress were very concerned about that. I think the Federal Reserve is very concerned about that. What is behind uh, those kinds of things? What, what, what substance are these capital requirements that all of us in the banking world have to have? Do they have any? Uh, certainly they would have unlimited ac ac access and availability and then all of a sudden something happens, the crash occurs, and who's behind it? So you, when you see the possibility of many, many thousand people losing a lot of money overnight, that's not a good, good thing to be looking at. Let's uh, return to the story of the company uh, a little bit. One thing that strikes me is Charles Schwab, the company, was always sort of uh, an underdog and up-and-comer trying to take on the big Wall Street giants, uh, and yet now it is a giant itself. It's, right. uh, it's an established company. It's among the incumbents. Um, how do you reconcile that? Well, I think we have a fundamental business case, and uh, as we take in every month, you know, 18, 20 billion dollars of net new assets from various investors around the country, that we are a fundamental uh, business that will be there for a long period of time. People come to us because the values are there, low pricing, the service is incredible, and it's sort of like, I, I look at this as everybody wants to drive a car. When you're 16 years of age, you want to drive a car, and everybody wants to have that independence. That's what a Schwab offers, or a Fidelity, or some of our other com wonderful competitors. We offer people the independence with the all, we all want, really as Americans, that independence, we love that. And so it's a fundamental uh, service that we provide to people and it will continue to grow and grow and grow as I see way off into the future. There's also a moment in the book where you talk about your sale to Bank of America in the 80s. Uh, it was sort of ill-fated, it didn't work out as had been hoped, um, but I wonder, would you have made that choice knowing what occurred uh, later on? Well, as luck would have it, uh, we were it was a great decision both ways. I don't think I'd do it over again, but at the time we needed money to grow. And so B of A stepped in and made that decision. We became you know, a small part of B of A. And four years later, it was an opportunity for me to buy the company back, which we did, which is a great moment in time. But there were a lot of reasons why we needed to be independent of Bank of America. They had their own problems, plus we had other uh, opportunities to move ahead into money market funds and other services that we couldn't offer under the guise of the B of A. Uh, a lot of my peers uh, of the millennial generation are pretty into this app Robinhood. I'm sure you've heard of mm -hmm. it. Oh, yeah. uh, they have their own brokerage and it's all digital first, VC backed, as you know. Yeah. What do you make of that startup? Uh, it strikes me as sort of punching up above its weight in the way that Schwab did uh, back yeah. decades ago. It, well, it's, it's sort of based upon a, sort of a questionable premise. It's based upon uh, the, the, the freebie part of the thing is they're getting payment from somebody else for your trade. They get payment for order flow from a third party. And they never give you price improvement. You go to a place like Schwab and almost every trade, 95% of the trades, we're giving you price improvement all the time. And, but they keep the price improvement, we give it back to the client. So it's sort of an artificial term. You say it's free. It really isn't free. It's costing you money, just like Facebook isn't free. <laughs> Google's not free. You're paying through the nose in a different way. There's been a, a lot of competition lately in the brokerage market, and yes. it's forced fees down. Uh, Charles Schwab has sure. actually cut fees itself. I think it's $495 for a trade. $495 for a trade. A million-dollar trade or a $1,000 trade, whatever, $495. Do you, do you expect that competition to increase and to maybe the function of a stock trade to become commoditized and go down to zero? And you know, can Schwab exist in that kind of world? Well, we'll be able to exist very comfortably, whatever world is presented to us, for sure. Uh, you know, we have millions of clients, and, uh, and that's good. Uh, and we have the wherewithal, the capital, and uh, we're not dependent upon venture capitalists trying to get a quick return. 
you know, were established. And more importantly, I think, than almost anything else, the brand that people can trust. And that's where people go, particularly in difficult times, like even now. People come to us in large numbers in difficult time periods. The brand has always been sort of synonymous with yourself, the person behind it, and yet in 2008 you stepped down, handed the reins over to Walt Bettinger. Right. How is that, you know, being so closely associated with your firm for so long uh, and then kind of stepping back a little bit? Uh, it's a natural thing to do. Uh, I've got to have the energy of the company, the young people taking over. I give some guidance. I'm still somewhat of the compass of the company, still the chairman of the board of the corporation and the bank and so forth. But it's wonderful for me to see the young people taking over. And the book actually talks about the passion we have for the investor, how we want to make their life better by the services we offer. And I think uh, one of the great purposes of the book, at least for me, was to really let the employees know what we were about, what our history was, and where we think we might want to go. And it's also for customers to read or anybody else to read, but that was one of the genesis of the book for me was I wanted to have our employees understand the fundamentals of the company, why we exist as a company, and what our purpose is, and why we have, I think, a great vista ahead of us. You handed the reins over right sort of in the midst of the financial crisis. Um, was that a difficult decision for you? It was certainly uh, a trying time for a lot of investors. Yeah, that was in 2008, so Walt's been now uh, CEO for 11 years, and uh, you know, nobody knew that 08 was gonna turn into 09, and of course, March of 09 was low, <clears throat> so in some ways, I, we were a little bit early. I'd like to turn the reins over to March of 09, the very bottom, but he had to wait one year. So it's taken off ever since. And so we've had the advantage of long-term growth, actually long-term growth over the, over the whole 40 years, 45 years of the history of the company. It's been a real growth story. We had Walt at our conference I over the summer in, uh, in Montauk, our Brainstorm Finance Conference, uh, and he talked about the need to win over millennials and how Schwab is doing a fine job of that. Um, but I wonder how you've had to change your marketing or your approach uh, or just how you address this different generation, how it might differ from past ones. I don't think there's a big change of our approach. I think we're finding that people under 35 which I include the millennials, we have a very high percentage of new customers who are in that age range, under 35. So we think we're doing the right thing. We've got some ideas that we're working on. Hopefully we'll be introducing some of them later this year that might attract more millennials, like give them some more flexibility in their investing and so forth. It'll be make it a little bit more fun. I won't, won't talk to you about it now, but Hang on, you'll see it maybe December or J January. What's your biggest investing tip? Well, I think right now, being tested on what the market is doing now, down 800 a couple days ago, and up 400, down 800, blah, 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 is having the steel, having the strength to sit through it while this stuff is emotionally just really testing you all the time. Should I bail out? This is too volatile for me, I can't handle it. Look back at history. Look back at any history book of stock markets. You always see this happening. You have to live through it because the big opportunity comes later, you know, next week, next year, as the growth occurs. And America is based upon growth. It always has been, frankly, always will be. It's based on the ingenuity, the intuitiveness of our minds, of our brains. That's what, that's really, what capitalism is all about. It's about the human creativity that goes on. And so we will do that. We will make more things and more different versions of things. You would never believe where you are today. You look back 50 years, what we had before was nothing. Today is great things. And 50 years from now, you'll look back today and say, this is pretty primitive. It'll be amazing when you notice that growth is what we are here in America, take the opportunity to participate in it. Hang on to your companies through thick and thin. And if they stop growing, then you can sell them and buy something else. But I have to say I'm a 
great fan of index funds for the average person. Uh, you get a participation in a broad range of companies, the whole of American economy, and uh, it itself will probably grow you know, 8 to 10 percent per annum for many years to come. But given, there'll be dips too. But on average, something like that. Uh, you mentioned this volatility. We're certainly seeing a lot of that right now, fueled by tensions in the trade war. We're seeing, uh, you know, treasury yield curves uh, inverted. What is your read on the market in the near term? Do you think that we're headed for a recession? Uh, and if so, when? I don't know. Uh, having lived through five or six, seven recessions, some economists, you know, <laughs> funny stories about economists, eight out of ten economists recommend, suggesting there's going to be a recession and it doesn't ever happen. And, so you, you take it with a grain of salt, you know. You, you've just got to be committed to investing. And don't let the press worry you into a recession is going to happen. What are you going to do? Uh, put all your money in the bank, and then that certain moment, you're going to know exactly when to buy at the low. It never happens. You just have to be in play, remain with your investment through thick and thin. That's the only way to really accomplish your long-term goal. What's the biggest mistake that you see regular, everyday, ordinary investors making? Well, just that. I, um, you know, having inappropriate diversification, they may have one stock, two stocks, three stocks. That's just not enough because you never know what might happen to a company. You've got to have at least 10 or 15 or 20, and the easiest way to do that is using index funds or a variety of uh, funds that provide wonderful diversification, but you have to have that. That's the easiest thing to have. It's free. Diversification is free. Just buy into it. You actually were an advisor to President George Bush uh, on sort of education around financial literacy. Uh, what resources would you recommend for investors getting interested in this and trying to take, a, um, you know, the controls on their well, own destinies. Well, it's unfortunate here. that schools don't offer a lot of help in that regard. So you're left to just go into a place like Amazon and look in the investment section and start reading some books about it. Get your feet wet. Open up an account at a place like Schwab and just buy a few things. Get yourself engaged. And once you put a hundred bucks in or a thousand dollars into it, you become, you become very quickly engaged. That's where your money is. It's like owning a car. Oh, boy. And all of a sudden you say, this is pretty easy. I can do this. And you get to understand it. Self-educate yourself. Because, unfortunately, schools are not going to do that for you today. Hopefully that will change in the future. Uh, financial literacy is critically important. Uh, your parents want you to do that for sure because they know themselves that they should have learned earlier than they did. And we all need to learn earlier than we did. Uh, but I would say that's, that's what I do. So what is Charles Schwab, you or the company, doing about financial literacy today? It's a very big and important issue. It really needs to be in the education system. It isn't today, unfortunately. So we do lots of things at the company to help people understand about. We have links about educating them. Uh, but right now, uh, I've set up just recently the F uh, Charles Schwab Foundation for Financial Independence. Proceeds from the book will go into it, plus some other contributions I'm making to it, to help and set up some programs in various schools. I'm, the first program I'm doing is with Stanford University, supporting a new undergraduate full course in, in financial literacy. And uh, I think the professor, Mike Boskin, and I both think it will be a very successful, very popular course. I wish I could have taken that when I was in To school. learn about this stuff <laughs> when you're 23 or 22. Um, and so, but it's important not only just in colleges, but I think junior colleges and maybe high schools too. But I'd like to see that spread out more broadly over time. It's a big subject for me and an important uh, goal I'd like to see. Thanks so much for sitting down with me today. Thank you.